Welcome to the Debate at GO8 podcast series, exploring issues and research affecting the Group of Eight Universities and by extension, Australia's economy and our society. My name's Ron Candelars. I'm a freelance journalist and producer. And throughout this series, we've been canvassing a range of topics, touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight Universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, the Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. Today we'll be talking with Professor Margaret Gardner, the President and Vice-Chancellor of Monash University. She's also Chair of the Board of the Group of Eight and is in her final year in that role. It's an opportune time to discuss some of the key issues facing the tertiary sector, especially given Professor Gardner's impressive track record here in Australia. Professor Gardner is speaking to us via Zoom and with me in the pod booth studio is the GO8's CEO, Vicky Thompson. Well, firstly, to you, Professor Gardner, it's been an incredibly difficult time for universities given the impact of the pandemic. What impact do you, from your perspective, think it's had on the sector and more particularly the GO8 universities in particular? I think there's been a really significant immediate impact for all universities, just as there has been for the whole of our society. And that immediate impact has been particularly felt uh, in, particularly in Victoria, but this year in New South Wales and the ACT, but across the country, in the impact of lockdowns, which have restricted what people do and therefore have had impacts on the way we engage with our students in universities. So the lockdowns had two impacts. One, students not being able to have the full on campus experience, which is a really important part of what uh, GO8 universities provide, but also our international students being locked offshore. And so even when we come out of lockdown in Australia and we're able to bring students back on campus or the universities who've been able to have their domestic students on campus, we've got a big cohort of students who are studying with us doing everything from PhDs through to undergraduate degrees who are sitting offshore and have had the sort of experience they expected really significantly affected. And that lockdown experience is an immediate, tangible and ongoing impact on how students experience the university. It's affected research. So it's particularly had an impact on fieldwork research an ability to go and undertake your fieldwork, though we've been able to keep a lot of laboratory research going and other forms of research. And it's had a big impact on staff who are actually dealing in this hybrid mode with students coming in and out, some being permanently, if you like, at a distance from all the services we provide. And that's put intense pressure on our, our staff who provide teaching and services, and there's been pressure on our researchers. So the immediate impact's really quite strong and ongoing. And the financial impact uh, has obviously been devastating and long-term. Um, so that's the other point of what's going on. What has actually happened has this immediate impact, which everybody can feel and we share with others around the world, but we've actually are facing a much longer-term impact Australia's borders have been closed for a considerable period of time, basically two years now, and, and no real clarity about when they will open. And because of that, all the things we would normally do and the engagement we would have, bringing international students to us affects our overall revenue. That is an impact that is being felt over multiple years. It's also affecting our ability to go overseas and engage uh, in projects with industry and government overseas. So that long-term impact of declining revenue, which we're feeling year on year, is a very significant detriment to our ability to undertake quality education and research. And that is being felt with um, the loss of staff, the loss of opportunity, the loss of ability to invest generally in the quality of what we do, and that is still with us, and there is no sign yet of when that will abate. And I dare say, Professor, 
Prior to the pandemic, many of the universities had expansionary policies in place to expand the role of their universities, the, the number of international students, the, the, the research work, etc. So all of this has a profound impact on projections for the future. Yes, um, I mean, there's been much made of the fact that some universities and some group of eight, including my own, have posted surpluses for 2020. But that was at considerable cost. Revenue declined and revenue continues to decline. And therefore, we have stopped doing lots of things. If you look at the campuses and what they do, the ability to support research, all of that has been constrained. So when you cut that, you slow everything that you're doing, you slow ability to undertake new endeavours, new initiatives. And that, again, you know, this, there's a long-term pipeline effect of, for example, doing what we've had to do and everybody's had to do, cut completely the expenditure on your facilities. It means that they are deteriorating over time and that you are not being able to uh, invest new. And a lot of research requires new investment and a lot of teaching and learning requires new investment for the, for the future. That's all basically ceased. We're on maintenance budgets there. We don't have the capacity to invest in that. People have depleted their reserves. There's, there's a very long-term effect being felt. Absolutely. And it's, it, and and we can't see what that will do for the future. To, to you, uh, the Vicky, future will not be will not be bright. To you, Vicky Thompson, though, this ultimately then impacts on the brand of universities, doesn't it? You know, the GO8 uh, universities in particular. You know, when when things are cut back so significantly, it, it has a long term impact impact on how our universities are seen and how they get out of this financially in the long term. Look, our brand is very strong. And so I'm not sure that it impacts upon our brand so much, but what it does do, and to pick up on Margaret's point, you know, Margaret's outlined very uh, articulately the the issues for our universities, you know, and just pick up the capital expenditure, for example. If we're not doing capital expenditure, it means we're not employing people to actually do that capital expenditure outside of our universities. Mm -hmm. It is a, a deep impact onto the broader economy and it is a long-term impact. So it's not a short-term sort of, you know, sugar hit for us. It's 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 quite serious uh, for the broader economy. And I think that's the piece of the puzzle that I think, you know, we're concerned about all sorts of things, but that's the piece of the puzzle that should really be worrying state and federal governments because if we don't have the capacity in the same way to educate the numbers of students we need, we know there's shortages looming and in the engineering space, if we don't have the capacity just to run our businesses, if you like, in terms of that capital expenditure so we can't employ the people that we normally would, that has an, a knock-on effect into the broader economy. And I think the point that Margaret makes really well is that these are long-term impacts. And similarly in research, I mean, that's our bread and butter in a sense for the group of eight universities. And that research that we can't do or we don't do at the scale that we want to do will have an impact not just on us, it's not research that we keep to ourselves. It's research that we are sharing into, you know, the nation and the and the world. Uh, that has an odd knock-on effect. So there are many pieces to the puzzle other than just a glib, you know, oh, well, the universities need more international students or they're posting surpluses or whatever it might be. There's a lot more to it than that. Well, getting to your university, Professor Gardner, Monash University is the nation's largest with the largest number of international students, and that market has obviously been dramatically affected. <laughs> how did you how did you record a surplus in 2020 in the first place, and, and where do you go from here long term? Well, we recorded a surplus by, in fact, very heavily constraining expenditure Remember, we were locked down for a very large part of last year. So all sorts of expenditure stopped really at quite an unusual level. In other words, a huge number of our buildings were closed. We were just not carrying normal operating costs, but we slashed our capital expenditure to the bone. We cut all types of non-salary expenditure, really we held it really tight. We effectively did not, we froze replacements of positions and so staffing numbers declined not by making people redundant but by not 
filling positions. And we actually did a deal with the union, um, the NTU, which enabled us to defer salary increases, enabled us to actually put in place a series of voluntary, I repeat, voluntary redundancies, and all that reduced expenditure, not just for 2020, but into 2021, the senior staff took a 20% pay cut. So we did everything we could. We leaned on every single area of expenditure. But the other thing we did was we actually spent money, more money on hardship funds for students, domestic and international, who were really strongly affected by the, the, the lockdown. And in fact, m- many of them losing their their, um, their, the jobs that they would normally do through the, through the semester. And we also worked extremely hard retaining the students who were with us who were locked offshore. And we did better at that than we even might have expected. So we held more students than, than we expected and we really slashed all expenditure and we borrowed. So we took every crisis measure we could, it produced a surplus, but it was a surplus on reducing revenue. And it was done so that we could weather the crisis that we knew was coming with more declining revenue in the years ahead. But of course, the longer the borders have stayed closed, every single scenario we put in place did not anticipate in 2020 that we would still not be clear that we would have bought that borders would remain closed. It looked like we're going to be closed in effectively for us into 2022. We have not yet had a signal that they will open. That's a very long crisis to weather. So that's what you really uh, what you really need from government now is a signal yes. that the 2022 is going to be different. So a, as we look at vaccination rates, you need a signal from government that that that, that are changes are afoot. Yes, we we actually need people to say what is going to happen when, because we are not able to, in good faith, engage with the students who are currently studying with us who want to get back on shore, with the students who might wish to come to us, and frankly, with the governments who provide scholarships to students from offshore to come to us. We've had governments now, Amman, Saudi, we've had indications from other governments that they are not going to provide scholarships to students to come to Australia because we have given no clear signal that they can come and study on campus. So we're losing, we're sort of destroying the faith and trust of the students who are studying with us. And the governments who've invested in scholarships with for students from their countries with us, and we're putting a question mark in people's mind about whether we are the sort of place Mm. and we have been and we wish to be that welcomes that diverse group of students and what they mean for the quality of our education for all our students, not just the ones we welcome from overseas, but the domestic students. They then study in a diverse and rich environment which prepares them for the future. All of those signals aren't there. We need clear signals. So some certainty, obviously. Uh, And to you, Vicky, obviously this is exacerbated by the fact that countries like Canada are opening up and and suddenly the competitive tension really ramps up. So our competitors are opening up. Canada opened up very recently uh, to international students. I actually don't think the UK closed to international students, even at the height of their pandemic. And the US is opened up. So... You know, Australia has always been a a destination of choice for international students. We've really punched above our weight. And universities like the one that Margaret leads, Monash, the largest in the country, the largest number of international students, has really led the way in having that very diverse student cohort. But the signals that are being sent at the moment is putting aside the borders being closed, is that we're not a welcoming country. And that's actually something that Australia's never really been. I mean, we are built on multiculturalism. Mm. And so our competitors are doing exactly what competitors should do. And I talk regularly to my my counterparts in those countries and, you know, they're marketing very aggressively. They're going in not just for students but for research, for PhDs, et cetera. And that's a very hard market to pick back up 
So as Margaret said, we're really relying on the goodwill of our current students and, you know, the prospect of new students coming in in the longer term to ensure we don't lose that market because it's a very important one for our students, for our universities, for our communities. Now, Professor Gardner, you talk about this need for greater certainty about where the universities are going and some clarity from government. The plight of the universities in the time of COVID has again brought into sharp focus this sometimes difficult and testy relationship where, with the Commonwealth Government. What can the GOA do to mend this relationship with the Commonwealth at a critical time? I actually think there's a very interesting story about this relationship which is not being told. So if you look at the engagement of a group of eight universities and universities with the federal government, our engagement with, for example, health, providing our students to provide surge workforces, pivoting our research to provide more work around vaccines, infectious diseases, epidemiology, public health. Our work in with all sorts of areas talking to government about the, 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 our engagement with industry, commercialisation, there's actually lots of positive engagement with federal government and with state governments. And in fact, at the moment, I would have to say the strongest relationships I've seen between universities and state governments in this nation for, I think, really for decades. So they're really good and positive relationships and people see the benefits we bring and how we work for the betterment, not of ourselves, but of our students who contribute to the community and the communities in which we're engaged. What we get is a, a sort of what a top level sort of discussion, which focuses on things that are not really the issues that we mostly talk to government about. So we get discussions about freedom of speech, which is not actually a great threat in our universities, and that you get a sort of testy discussion around that. We get discussions about foreign interference. There's not a lot of evidence that there's a really great threat in this space, and the universities have responded and have always been engaged in being responsibly engaged on foreign interference. But threat aspects, if you like, culturally are raised, and that seems to be the basis on which people read the relationship. And that seems to me to be a very unfortunate and really limited way of talking about the way universities are embedded in the future of our society and our economy. But it does tend to actually recognised in the day to day interactions. I get that, but but it is uh, it does do dominate a lot of the headlines. It creates yes. this impression that there's bad blood between the universities and the Commonwealth. Issues arise about funding and the the situation that the universities find themselves in now. In order to get past some of those issues, it seems to me that there's got to be some sort of rapprochement with the Commonwealth Government over a range of different issues. How does the GO8 manage that process? I actually think we're, we've now seen across a range of issues a need for rethinking. So if you look, go back to the funding issue, governments for a long time have been cutting funding to universities for their support of domestic students. We actually get less dollars uh, now to support the education of Australian students in Australian universities than we got a decade ago, if you go on, you know, purchasing power. And there's parliamentary library evidence on this. And in fact, the Job Ready Graduates package administered right on the, right into this crisis, a cut to the dollars we get to educate students. And in fact, those dollars that the Commonwealth is now providing are focused on education and what has been left to one side and is still under discussion is how you get sustainable research funding. So the thing I would say in terms of rapprochement is actually we need a sensible discussion about sustainable funding base for the universities for the future, not the piecemeal interventions that are going on at present. And we need to actually, as a society, understand what that means in terms of funding properly, the number of places we need. We're short of engineers. We're short of doctors. We're short of nurses. These are, and there is no more funding in the system 
Yeah, this is so, this is so an issue that, that we need to pick that up. Absolutely, that's what needs to happen. But can I say there's one other thing that goes to this sort of testy cultural aspect? I really do think that the relationship between governments and universities needs to actually be mitigated or moderated by a more distant relationship than is currently the case. When you've got a situation with large autonomous universities with long funding horizons, with uh, lo longevity in all the programs they do, governments that are driven by short-term electoral cycles mm. and are subject to the pressures of public opinion on a regular basis, universities are uncomfortable places. Mm. People have freedom of speech and academic freedom. They say things governments don't like. <laughs> The reason you make universities autonomous is to preserve that capacity for, for, in fact, speaking the uncomfortable, for researching the, un, the unknowable, for actually providing the education for the future that isn't buffeted by current populist effects. We actually need to be able to, to change the governance overall between federal government and universities so for the Margaret, future, you... I think there is a need for a buffer body yeah. which would stop a lot of this mm. tetchy debate, university to minister, which is driven by factors that don't go would, to the... Would you agree with that, Maggie? Well, I was just going... I mean, Margaret, I think you are our longest-serving vice-chancellor in the country. You know, she yeah. speak, comes, comes at it from a, a vast experience in a range of institutions and both of us have been around and seen many governments come and go. So this is... This is not a new discussion in many ways, no. right? Um, but the question I was going to ask you, and yes, a buffer body is something that we have spoken about. And I think back in the day there was a, there a was kind one. of a, a body that sort of sat mm. in between and we've lost that. And my kind of observation is that governments have become ironically sort of more interventionist whilst also wanting us to preserve all the things that make us, you know, institutions of freedom of speech and, and, and academic freedom, et cetera. Do you think that that is a hallmark of this particular government or that this is a hallmark of the sort of society we live in, that there needs, they think there needs to be more oversight and intervention rather than just letting us get on with what we do? Because there's never really been any, as you've said at the beginning, there's no great evidence that we've actually contravened any foreign policy issues. I mean, we yes, there is foreign interference and it's heightened in every area of the economy. But it seems that we're the ones that mm. are front and centre. And so I'm just interested in your views, because you have been around so long, about that kind of shift in that interventionist nature of, of governments into the business of what we do as universities. I think it's actually, ironically and perhaps paradoxically, a product of actually becoming more important in the economies of the future. So let's be clear in my lifetime, universities have gone from being places that a very small proportion of the population attended, where a very a relatively small proportion of the population actually needed that education to be engaged in the sort many of the occupations that were important to that economy, uh, in which research was not really front and centre in as many fields as we see now, not 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 in front of people in terms of how they understand the things that are going to make their lives better or change the way we do what we do. I think, in fact, they've become more interventionist in an odd sort of way as we've become more embedded in many aspects of life and that prominence of outcomes, the ability of social media to amplify what is said from and in institutions such as us, brings the, them into the debate with us and is causing them to wish to intervene and control things that they, at various times and for various reasons, find they're not in sympathy with. I think that we understand that the autonomy of institutions and their ability to actually take that long-term view and preserve the scholarly community for the future is really important. 
And that's why I look and I think we need to go back to the buffer bodies where we are able to have the longer term planning discussions, the longer term discussions about what needs to be done in response to a range of things from foreign interference through to freedom of speech in ways that are considered and not driven by populist politics. If you look, it has only been in recent years that I have seen ministers hold up research grants on the basis, research grants that have been cleared by peer review as being important on the basis of some other consideration mm -hmm. that they have in their mind. This is very disturbing and not a good way to proceed. Professor, so we I'm need to think about how we get the right sort of governance in so that these debates, it's, it's I, I dealt obviously with... fine for ministers to have views about things, but they shouldn't be immediately unmediated affecting, affecting for, outcomes, for, for example, in research. Professor, I'm, I'm aware of time getting away from us. I just want to ask one last question, given your amazing history in academia over a long period of time and your involvement in universities in America and here in Australia. As we look to the future, what, what do you see the role of universities in the years ahead? Are, are they about preparing, you know, students for jobs? Uh, are they about commercialising research? What, what is the role of the university as we move into the, the, the next 10, 20 years? In some ways, the role of the university, as I said, has expanded. So, yes, it's become more important to have a university education for a whole range of careers and occupations that we see now and ones we can't see. I think it remains important that we're not preparing people for the ones we can see at the moment. We've always been about preparing people so they have the creativity, the independence, the skills, the ability to keep learning and drawing evidence from the community to actually create their own careers, their own new futures. And so the the university remains incredibly important for exposing people to all the skills and capabilities that will give them the ability to create new, as well as to respond to what is now a bigger demand from the, from the economy and the society for the skills we provide them in, in key professions and more generally as university educated graduates. The second thing I think that has happened is, yes, we have to keep that discovery, the finding new knowledge, the pushing new frontiers to thinking about the world differently, because that's how we generate new ideas and creativity. But I think the universities are now more than ever more involved and will be more involved with industry in talking about how we translate and transfer into the sorts of things that are coming before us. And I think we're going to be more significant to new ventures and new ways of dealing with the big challenges before us. So I actually think the, it's not that the universities will be just about job-ready graduates or just about commercialisation, but in fact they have become more important to the readiness for the future, They both through research and education. And I think their role will expand and they will be more embedded in creating new spin-outs, new startups in the ecosystems around them, that the future will make them more important to their communities and more central to them, not less. Professor, thanks very much for your time today. Congratulations on a remarkable career and also as your position as chair of the board of the Group of Eight comes to an end, congratulations on the role that you've played. Um, we run out of time, but thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Vicky. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, please visit our website at geo8.edu.au. And a quick reminder that you can always tune into the debate at Geo8 on Spotify, Google, Apple or YouTube. Bye for now.